everyone. Um, so I have my coffee today, as promised. I'm going to try not to yawn through this one as well. So we're back with the Midler and we're going with chapter nine. And today we are starting a new day with Maggie, Wednesday the 3rd of September. So Trig was bent over the kitchen table, his hand curled all the way round his pencil. His dad's visiting bag was right next to his feet. There must be some more antibiotics in there now. Can't only be Elsie that needs them. Trig had been way too slow at school again. His teacher had found him a piece of furry edged paper and a stubby pencil so he could finish his work at home. So there he was, writing out Andrew Salisbury's eldest edict in his very best handwriting. Taking ages. I could have done it a thousand times over by the time he'd reached the end of the first line. From this day forth, every eldest child at age 14 will be awarded the privilege of attending military camp. I don't blame him for being slow, though. Probably would have been quicker if they picked something more interesting than an old politician's speech from a million years ago. Like a poem or something. A song. I sat on the end of the table with my feet on a chair, put my fingers either side of my head, tried to wiggle my ears. Lack of strength, intellect or character will be no barrier. Each one of them will fight for country and glory in this terrible war. Their childhoods will be joyous and a peaceful life is guaranteed for the rest of the family, who from now on will not see the war, nor hear it, nor touch it. It will become the invisible war. The quiet war. I will call on you to support those who support the edict and punish those who do not. Shame upon any who refuse to send their eldest to camp. Shame upon them and their kin. Trig finally finished. Weird thing was, he had the worst handwriting out of all of us if you made him hurry up. But if you gave him as much time as he wanted, it was beautiful. It always, all, loop, all ups and downs and tails and loops. It always made his hand ache though. He flopped his wrist in front of me. It hurts, Maggie, it hurts. It's all right, you're finished now. Nice job too. Why don't you go and help Dad outside? He's doing something with the courgettes. Want me to put this in a safe place? Thanks, Maggie. He ran out. Dad! Dad! I've finished my handwriting! I hooked the visiting bag out from under the table with my foot, pulled it open, rooted around inside. Nothing. No bottles at all. Not even ones that weren't antibiotics. Not even after all that waiting. I shoved it back under the table. I took Trig's writing into the sitting room and put it on a shelf. The real Jed's eyes followed me across the room. I saw something in the bottom right corner of the painting. He stepped closer. Jed G. Cruz, eldest bound for glory, H.S. Weatherall. I walked backwards into the kitchen with Jed eyes following me all the way. I shut the door after me. So, Mum dropped her rucksack onto the table. Bits of dried mud fell off it and scattered everywhere. It's Jed's party on Friday. We're going to need some help getting things ready. Me and Maggie never get a party. Trig pressed his fingernail into a piece of mud, making even more mess. Why can't we have parties too? Jed's an eldest. Dad came over with a wet cloth, but Mum swooped an arm across the table before he got there, pushed all of the mud onto the floor. I caught Dad's eye. He winked. There's a lot to do, said Mum. First things first, Trig, would you go over to the Weatheralls after dinner and get a forecast from Elsie? I don't want to be using the town hall if I don't have to. Elsie? Why do I have to go, said Trig? It's Jed's party, so he should go, shouldn't he? Jed never has to do anything. Elsie Weather. Mum's asking you, Trig, said Dad. Elsie Weather, who, for absolutely certain has got a bottle of trellisillin in her house. But I don't like going to see Elsie. She never smiles. I keep watching her to see if she'll smile, but she never does. Not even. I'll go. They all looked at me. I'll go and Trig can do whatever you are going to ask me to do. That all right? I don't care who does what, as long as it gets done. Mum roughed up her hair. It stood on its ends. Take her some cheese, Maggie, for payment. Not cheese? Dad picked up a dish of new potatoes from the work surface. Flour. Take a jug full of flour. 
All right then, Mum swiped a potato from the dish. Cheese and flour. Trig gave me a huge, great Trig hug. Thanks, Maggie. That means you're making pastry with Dad after dinner, Trig, said Mum. A lot of pastry. Trig slumped into a chair. But I hate making pastry. Tough, he said. I pushed the woodpecker door knocker. Tapped its head forward so it pecked on the door. Peck, peck, peck. The Siamese cat crept up, gave a snarly meow. I knocked again. Peck, peck, peck. The cat blinked. Peck, peck, peck. I knocked harder. The door opened and the cat get, the cat shot inside. All right, all right. Give an old woman a chance to get down the stairs. It was Elsie leaning on her stick, dressed in the exact same red check dress I have to wear to school. Must be a hundred years old, though, since she was a schoolgirl. Um, I was wondering, Mrs. Weather, if I could get a forecast. Her eyes went to the jug. Flour, I held it up. I've bought flour for you and cheese. Forecast? I nodded. She opened the door wider. I stepped inside. She closed the door behind me and the hall went dark. Only a gravy. Oh, gosh. I need to drink more coffee. I stepped inside. She closed the door behind me and the hall went dark. Only a grimy bit of light leaking in through the fanlight. My eyes took a moment to adjust. The hall had piles of things all down one side. Coats, odd shoes, stacks of boots, even heaps of paper. More paper than I'd ever seen in one single place. I glanced over it all, checking for a little brown bottle. Um, Mum says, quiet cruise girl. Hannah's got a sitting. The door next... The door to Mr Weatherall's painting room was ever so slightly open. A slice of someone, a girl I think, was just visible through the gap. Mr, Wes Mr Weatherall's soft voice murmured in the background. Elsie held out her free hand for the cheese. She unwrapped a corner and sniffed it, slipped it into her apron pocket, held out her hand again, and I passed her the flower. In there, she pointed to the back room with a jug. I'll get tea. Oh no, Mrs Weather, it's... Quiet girl, in there. Trig was right. She didn't ever smile. The back room was packed full of all kinds of junk. Boxes and crates, old pots and bowls, mugs with the handles broken off, cables with plugs on the end that fit into the wall, boards with the whole alphabet written on them in little squares. All useless, Dad would say. And there were books. Piles and piles of books. Some on shelves that went right up to the ceiling. Ten times as many as the whole school library. I picked my way between the stuff, sat down on a half-empty chair, moved a glass off the seat. L.A. Angels, it said on it. On the wall in front of me hung old photographs and certificates and little wooden carvings and even two long, thin masks that had straw for hair and empty spaces where the eyes should be. Everything was ancient and crooked and squashed together. I bent forwards and lifted the flap on a cardboard box. It was full of yellowy printed paper. Newspapers from the old days. Shame upon them! Read a thick black sentence across the top of the paper. The rest of the writing was smaller. A family was driven out of Midleaf by angry neighbours last week when they defied the eldest edit and refused to send their son to camp. Driven out? I pulled back some of the papers and read another one further down the pile. Together, we can save our country. Andrew Salisbury, leader of the opposition, speaks a message of hope. Will it win him in next week's snap election? I looked up at another, even further down. Dark times are upon us. A series of coordinated worldwide terrorist attacks have. Cruise girl? I dropped the papers and sat up. Tea? Elsie shuffled through the door with a sloshing mug. I stepped back through the jug and took the mug. I sniffed it. Chamomile. Yuck. Thank you, Mrs Weather. Elsie made her way across the room with her stick. She stopped to wheeze after each step. <sighs> <sighs> Can I help? I said. Shall I clear a path for you? Don't touch it. It's Hannah's. Maybe to Mr Weatherall this stuff wasn't junk at all. Maybe it was treasure. I sipped at my tea. If I sipped at it enough times, I'd get to the bottom eventually. Elsie reached the glass doors at the back. 
What do you want to know then, cruise girl? Forecast for Guy Fawkes, Christmas, 100% right, every time, nature doesn't lie. Doesn't have the capacity. Just Friday, please, Mrs Weather. My mum wants to know whether it'll rain on Friday. Jed will be 14, see? It's his party. She grunted. Mm. Struggled with the key for a moment and opened the door. The garden looked even messier than the house. Overgrown vegetables, clambering ivy, sprawling shrubs, shadowy trees... Plants and leaves creeping, pouring, climbing over everything. Elsie prodded with her stick, found firm ground and stepped out. Wait there, she said. She wobbled across the weed-woven patio, somehow managing to stay upright. Then she waded into the undergrowth in search of insects to pinch and seed heads to break open. I didn't have long. I crept back out into the hall. Mr Weatherall couldn't see me from this angle. I looked over the piles of coats and shoes and books. No sign of any medicine bottles. Checked in between the stacks of paper. Quiet as you like. Still no medicine. Where else could it be? Think, Maggie. Where would Dad keep ours? I looked around. The kitchen. It was as chaotic as the rest of the house. Worse, maybe. Water barrels and a potato pin bin just sitting there in the middle of the floor. Wonky piles of crockery and an overgrowing, overflowing compost box on the worktop. The Siamese cat curling in and out of them. And over by the back window, a table. Definitely the sort of place you might put a bottle of medicine. I balanced my mug on the edge of the worktop and went to investigate. The table was completely covered. Bits of cutlery, old coins going green, orange handled screwdrivers, an empty vase with a dark ring round its inside, books, glasses, mugs, a hacksaw, and there, at the edge, a small brown medicine bottle with a trellis in it. There was a window behind the table. Elsie was still in the garden, turning over leaves and squeezing scrubs, squeezing grubs. I picked up the bottle. Elsie P. Weatherall, trellis in 250 milligrams, still almost full. I looked back to check Mr Weatherall and his visitor were in the front room and stopped dead. And that is the end of chapter nine. Sorry I keep scratching my face. Finn has decided to join me today and I keep getting his fur all over my face. So let's talk about the middler. The why where we've got to so far is that maggie has now offered to go to elsie weatherall's house because she knows that the trellisillin antibiotics that una needs is at her house and she's found it in the kitchen and she turned around to check whether miss where miss, whether mr weatherall was still in his room and she stopped dead i wonder what will happen tomorrow <laughs>